naked shamanism. Welcome to With Insights Radio. I'm your host, Iggy Garcia. I will take you on a journey across the universe through shamanism, metaphysical, and holistic. So sit back and relax and enjoy the show. All right. I want to welcome everybody to With Insights Radio, Iggy Garcia Live. We are in episode 183. Well, actually, 139 now. That's how fast this uh, this thing explodes into. Um, so I'm going to turn down my volume here on my end so I don't hear myself twice. Because that would get really annoying after a while. All right. All right. So, everybody, welcome to uh, the show. Um, I'm Miggy Garcia. So how we're going to start off the show is we're going to do a little ceremony like we always do. We're going to light a candle to our ancestors giving thanks. Uh, my friend Don is on the air. Don Dancing Otter. She's with us tonight. She's my guest. She's been on here before, and we're going to catch up with her and see where she's at and what she's doing and what cool things she's going to um, bring to the table and share with us. So yeah. I raised this candle giving thanks to all those who have come before us, those who have laid the path, those who have created the opportunity for us to be where we're at. It took a lot of people to work very hard to get us and our siblings and everybody in this lineage to the place it is today. So I want to thank my mom and dad, their ancestors, my ancestors, all my relations, everybody on this planet, everybody who has worked very diligently to get us here. Now we are the new people, the new wave who are going to one day be the ancestors. We want to give thanks and we want to learn from their example because one day we will be the elders. And with that, let's see. Oh, thank you. And then we're going to light a little sage. Never go wrong with sage. So. Good old sage from my bundle. Good old sage from my yard from last harvest from last year. Mm. <laughs> Take it in, yeah. Mm. And then just let that burn there. While we're going through the show, so welcome everybody. I'm your host Iggy, and this is my friend Don. She's with us today. She's going to be with us for probably an hour or so. Maybe I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We're gonna, we'll see how it all all floats and goes out to the universe. So, Don, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, in this very moment, Iggy, I'm doing well, and it's really good to see you too. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think we've ever done a live video uh, podcast together, have we? Everything's been over the phone. Audio, yeah. Yeah, so this is really cool. So this is like new territory for us. We actually get to talk to each other as close as face to face as we're going to get right now. Ooh, the technology, Iggy. Just mind-blowing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> mm. We're shiny people. Here we are. Mm -hmm. Zoom's been a good good platform for us to do shows and stuff like that. So, so um, there's been a lot of changes in the world, and you probably – know what i'm talking about all the things with uh just the pandemic and everything that's going on in the world and the things we have to kind of line align ourselves with that maybe we're in alignment or not alignment with so uh you live on another part of the of the world in another in another country completely different which probably sees the world com uh has a whole set of rules compared to what we have here in the states mm. i live in so before I say that, I will say I live um, in Lekwungen traditional territory mm -hmm. um, on a place now known as Vancouver Island. That's the colonialized name for it. Nice. Um, in the, the territory now, the people are now known as Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. This is unceded and stolen territory. Okay. And uh, and I'm a settler on this land. When you ask what's happening here, um, it depends on what layer you're talking about. Um, the layer of regular behavior, people have seemed to be honorable with each other here. And uh, we haven't seen some of the same kinds of behavior that have been highlighted in lots of other places where people are, um, kind of tearing each other apart. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in some ways, the fact that 
where we live now, it's so freaking beautiful, really. Like it's, it's paradise that I think that becomes uh, a method for people to discharge some of their anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, however, <clears throat> there have been many things that uh, have become to light here that uh, people have had, I guess, time and opportunity to focus on. Um, one of those things is uh, is the stolen land that we're on, and okay. the fact that our government is uh, is interestingly behaving as though nothing needs to change about that. And Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of pipeline uh, building and and the politics that are going on here right now, which may be far away from what is in the attention of your good people. Uh, Because in Canada, um, you know, we we definitely have different supports from our government. uh, Mm -hmm. and, And so we haven't had the same level. We've had lots of suffering, but just different levels of it and different yeah. ways it's showing up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. I know that can get very complicated. One of the reasons I wanted you to come on the show today was because I was really curious about how you as a healer are working through all this uh, new energies, all this new uh, uh, perceived chaos, all this, all this energy that's just very hard to grasp onto and try to navigate. And I know that most of us, I, we talked a little bit after before we got on the air about how things are going. And uh, like I was telling you, some of the changes that I had to go through. So take us on a little journey. This time last year, um, I, I was um, just like everyone else, you know, everything kind of stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all we all went inside. Uh, I never really stay inside. I tend to wander outside um, as uh, as much as I can break rules. And uh, in that way, I can't be away from nature. Um, around this time last year, so the beginning of April last year, um, my phone didn't stop ringing for weeks on end because in Canada, a lot of our, well, at least in this part of Canada, a lot of our services are essential services because all the offices kind of closed Mm -hmm. in the transition point where things were going online um, and where things were getting set up so people could have uh, access to um, social workers and mental health uh, support. Um, I was already set up that way and have been for a long long time. Mm -hmm. I'm not a publicly funded mental health professional. I'm uh, I guess in terms of uh, what I'm what I'm uh, certified to do, is I'm a coach, and so. Uh, but a lot of people in my community know that I support recovery. I support, like, I support people in trauma. I support people who are having really hard time. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the people that I've been supporting in in recovery, uh, they they started using again. They started drinking again. Uh, you know, a lot of chaos just ensued in terms of people who were very working really hard just to try and have some traction in life. A lot of those people just felt like they had been fragmented yet again. And so my phone didn't stop ringing for weeks. And I crashed pretty hard. Um, maybe like the end of April last year, I crashed pretty hard. I was exhausted. Um, and I, I didn't really have like my people who normally support me were also really over overloaded so we were all getting pretty hit uh, in terms of support the end of april last year i i visited someone who i hadn't heard from in a number of days and i knew that he was in high risk circumstance and found mm-hmm. him dead uh, and i'm sorry to hear that uh, yeah and i crashed again pretty hard I had I had a pretty good wobble after that Um, a lot of what occurred to me last year over this last year um, I guess if you if you feel okay where you are Mm -hmm. adjusted to the the sicknesses around you in a system that doesn't actually give any cares for you Mm -hmm. if you're okay in that system you're probably okay in COVID. 
you know, you're probably okay when things get locked down. You're probably getting some kind of support. But if you weren't okay before, you're really not okay now. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of people who were not okay and who are not okay. Yeah. And, um, and that's not even speaking to the people who have contracted COVID or suffering. Like, mm -hmm. um, I know a number of people, I lost people in my life that were important to me. Yeah. Uh, one of them who was a teacher in my life. So, and I mean, people who I care about, like my mother, uh, not that I care about more people than my mother, but I care about no, no, my mother get, a great deal. I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, sure. But she's very close to me. My mother, who's had various pretty severe lung conditions over the, over her adult life, um, you know, I worry about her a lot because, I mean, she can't go out right now and she hasn't, she's periodically not been able to go out and she can't really engage because if she caught COVID, it would be devastating. She, yeah. it would, yeah. And so, I mean, I believe anyone can heal from anything, but I also know that that depends on time and how much time you get to heal from that. And, you know, when you get later into your life, sometimes you don't have enough time for the thing, the healing you need to do. Sure. Um, so that's my fear when it, when it comes to my mother. Um, and I fear I'll never see her again. I fear mm. that. Um, that's real grief. Sure. Like my heart, my heart hurts when I think about it. I live way across the country from her and mm. I fear I won't see her again. Mm. Um, and I pray I will. Right. Um, and somewhere near November, I started to get, uh, I started to get burned out again. I had a pretty good summer. I, I had lots and lots of ceremonies and mm -hmm. did lots of outdoor stuff where people could congregate in small groups. And it seemed like things were kind of ticking along. And then I crashed again in, in fall. I kind of, I had my 50th birthday, Iggy, I turned 50. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in, at the end of October. And it was like a, a passage for me to be, now in this part of my life, which I guess is the latter part of my life, um, but who knows, right? The latter part of my life could have been started at 30. Who knows, yeah, who knows how true. long you get, yeah, who yeah. knows how long you get. But um, I do know that uh, when I turned 50, that felt significant. And I kind of crashed right after that because um, I miss people, I miss connection. My younger son who's in high school, uh, I miss, he, he's missing out. He's missing out on the most social time of his life. And yeah. uh, he's a very social creature. So mm -hmm. we're adapting kind of intermittently to that experience. Um, and I decided, I fell asleep one night having like a vicious, vicious uh, uh, hot flash at around 11 o'clock, um, sweated through my clothes. This is the fun part of being 50. Um, sweated through my clothes, got up, got changed, got got a dry clothes, went back to bed. And immediately I had this crazy dream about um, getting my master's degree. And I was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go back to school. There's no way. Mm -hmm. And then within a few weeks I had applied and then I got accepted. And so now I'm <laughs> doing that thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, never say never. I'll never go back to school. And yeah, that so universe, I'm, that universe hears us. So that piece of like, you know, I'm, and I'm kind of in my witchier years now. So I'm in mm -hmm. this place of really appreciating what I could offer with more academic credentials. Um, so that's people still pay attention to that thing, you know, and yeah. some people anyway, uh, <laughs> that uh, I also um, started a podcast called The Witch's Diagnostic. Nice. Um, and I'm writing a book called The Witch's Diagnostic. So there's like, there a bunch go. of different projects going on that uh, that have my attention and um so through this whole year lots has been born lots has you know passed away i'm uh i i move through moments of like really big grief um and movement moving through moments also of of deep joy so yeah. there's a lot it's been everything in between too yeah you know, I, I am, what I'm finding, you know, I do a lot, I work with a lot of grief work with people who have mm -hmm. lost uh, family members through, you know, just the, the, the basic way of, of life <clears throat> through hospice and stuff like that through, with drumming. 
so I see a lot of different things and they call me in to do ceremonies for them sometimes. Mm -hmm. What is interesting now is that we've kind of done away with a lot of those things, those programs, because just because of the separation and being apart, it's going to be really interesting how we deal with the grief part of, you know, there's so much loss in such a short period of time. And I, I'm not sure how to grasp onto that sometimes because that's kind of the work I do. So it's been interesting to just watch how that is playing out and the people who were really involved in, especially the care the caregivers and people who uh, work in the, in the front lines for say uh, in the hospice centers and watching and people can't be with their ones they're, they're, they're leaving. And it's just been really interesting um, dynamic for a lot of people that I work with. I'm on the opposite scale. Like on you, on your phone went ringing. My phone kind of went dead, which is kind of, mm -hmm. kind of strange because everything, you know, was kind of in a certain pattern, the way I worked. Just now it's starting to ring again and it's starting to come back up, but it's just interesting how it is and how we are uh, navigating these new uncharted waters. I don't watch TV much. So sometimes the TV's on because family members are watching. I have to walk out of the room because it's just, the, the news is just too much. It's, mm -hmm. it's it, everything is about la, 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 la. oh we're gonna all die you know <clears throat> you know whatever you feel in your head whatever you feel in your body I believe that you start to hear that enough it plays out in your head enough you start to manifest and create that stuff and invite into your your life not trying to avoid it not trying to hide from it but you know it's just something that's very I have found over the years you know who you associate with or what you're listening to or what you're reading plays a big impact to who you are today. Big part. Big part. You yeah. know, you are what you are what you consume. Yeah. And we were talking about me being on this uh this fast. You are what you consume. Mm -hmm. You are what you consume. And sometimes things are consuming you, you know? Good and point. that's a, a piece of 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 acknowledgement that people who do what we do mm -hmm. need to really pay attention to because um, like really I could be super sacrificial. I could take my entire body and throw it on a pyre and sacrifice myself to the incredible need yeah. of, that people have out there. And mm -hmm. it wouldn't be enough. Like I, I don't have enough body or time yeah. or power or energy mm -hmm. or any focus or any of that to deal with all of that. So there are many of us and the opportunity is that more of us awaken so that, that the self healing experiences, the healers among us mm -hmm. wake up and also support the, the younger people's healing experience that is starting to awaken so that we can all help each other that way. Yeah. Um, and that we're, none of us are getting consumed um, because we are, you know, the person. Right. like the the edge witch or mm -hmm. the you know the village healer like i i believe that we all need to to take good care of each other mm -hmm. um, and that we also need to take good care of our village healers yeah mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's playing out very interesting i i do agree with you that with that i'm watching i'm watching healers suffer a lot more than i probably mm -hmm. have especially in my community I'm one of them, you know, I've had my down moments where I'm like, whoa, what, what can I do? What I was doing before isn't going to be really enough to, to motivate or to help or to put somebody in, in a place where they feel safe or comfortable. So everything is just like a whole new game plan has to be developed. And I, mm -hmm. I'm finding that really, it's a challenge, but it's also really fun too, to some extreme. It's like, okay, I got to be creative. Whatever I was doing before, I, that's not going to work. We had a drum circle uh, this Saturday, past Saturday. And we had probably had like 50 some people and it was beautiful because we hadn't had a drum circle like the net capacity of a drum circle in a while because everybody you know because of just all the restrictions and everything everybody was nervous and you know some people had their masks on some people didn't some people said i got i got vaccinated you know it's just you have a whole school of people so you're, you you got to learn to navigate all this these different beliefs and ideologies that people carry with them because uh as, as a healer, you're also a community builder. You're, you're helping people uh, build the community back because it's fractured. It's fractured because people see it differently, uh, have to experience it differently. That's the biggest thing. They have to experience it 
it much different than they did before. You know, you and I could just walk down the street, go to the store, and it was no big deal. Now it's like a big deal. Now it's like, wait, did I forget this for that? You know, our our whole process is different. Mm. Yeah, we've changed. Something big has changed for all of us, and mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, the somebody asked me not too long ago, or maybe it was. I lose track of time, <laughs> but. I seem to hear it. I remember hearing it not too long ago. Do do Don? Do you think that that we're in an initiatory process? Mm. And I said, well, of sorts, because initiatory processes, by and large, are invited. Mm -hmm. You know, like like when you are moving from in your rite of passage from you know childhood to adulthood there's usually some signatory experience that takes you into that, you know, that, so you're no longer the person you were before, you're not the child, but usually that is expected um, mm -hmm. or that is invited. And we didn't, most of us weren't aware of this. Like some people, you know, I, I have lots of like really smarty pants scientists in my social circles. So they knew this stuff was going to happen um and then i have some real like metaphysicians in in my circle and they knew this stuff was going to happen i'm always like well i don't know like i don't know what's going to happen so we'll we'll see mm -hmm. um but most of us didn't know and therefore could not invite so it's not exactly like an initiatory process i believe that we are in uh a healing process mm -hmm. and i believe we have been sick i believe we've all been participating in something deeply ill um and i'm not talking about politics now sure sure i understand. I, I get what you're saying yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm talking about the way that we behave as humans uh towards creaturehood and with each other um and towards this earth it's, it's not in a place of wellness um, and so we got sick. We all got sick together. And yeah. uh, my 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 contribution is let's get well together now. Okay. Yeah. So what's that look like? <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Let's get well together. Um, I have a few different responses to that. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. That's one for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, my first response is where do we draw our um, where do we draw our wisdom okay. in order to heal? Um, and that our wisdom, if we go back into the old canons of um, you know science, medicine, uh, and the like, uh, that are very much like here's your body and here's whatever else we can't explain let's mm -hmm. focus on this part because this part is what we know this is what we can create evidence around mind you this part over here is something that indigenous folk have known very well the spiritual aspect they've known it very well for, mm -hmm. for as long as we've been human and so uh and they've passed that down through their oral traditions etc so if we only seek out the things that are like about the material moment, mm -hmm. like if we, we heal the body, um, hang on, my earbuds are doing a funny thing, sorry. <laughs> I can still hear can, you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my earbuds just went disconnected, connected. I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> it's like, we're going to lose you there. <clears throat> you know, describing maybe describing what I was describing that disconnect piece of like let's heal let's take the body the animus away from the spirit and we'll describe the animus but not the spirit and we've what what we're seeing now is the repercussions and the and the consequences of that projected in big in massive like everywhere we go in yeah. every aspect of our being and so and and if we request that those who remember those those indigenous ways begin to teach maybe these scientists and these metaphysicians or these these physicians um 
the ways of connecting into spirit and how those things are inseparable um, and that spirit creates blood, bone, you know, all of those things creates all the things we touch okay. and that all the things come from those worlds from three woods really compressed into one that we can visual that we can see um, that when we start to um, we start to make those indigenous uh, healers wisdom keepers um, the voice of how mm -hmm. we go forward I believe we have a better shot at healing okay um, if we try and apply the same set of principles of how we got here to where we want to go. I mean, as you know, like, how do you define insanity? You do the same thing over and over again, mm -hmm. expecting different results. Right. We cannot, we can't do that. You know, it's not even logical to, to consider it. And yet we think that's how it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Um, like if we give everyone a vaccine, we can just get on with it. Right. Well, okay, right. maybe maybe the vaccine works and maybe it's questionable. Who knows? I'm not questioning. That. Maybe mm -hmm. it works, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Not my place. Right. But do we really think that the stuff that's sick about how we've been living gets healed that way? No. I don't think we get healed that way. Absolutely not. No. And that's hard to relay that message sometimes to people. You know, that message of, oh, yeah, let's take a shot. You know, because... We're trying to heal spiritual and physical aspects of ourselves and i get what you're saying and yet we're missing the point when we t when we let's say we say let's just say so hypothetically someone takes a shot and they're in this whole another camp oh yeah i'm safe now blah 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 oh you're not gonna take a shot i see a lot of this oh well, it's almost like well you better not come around me blah blah you know I might get sick i see i see what we've still not worked we still not got past that alienation, that separation, <clears throat> that uh, that lack of my all my relations. Just because uh, you take the shot, oh my God, I took a flu. Sh I've taken a flu shot what ten years ago, maybe at most, because I had to go to Peru and I had to go on a trip. That's the only reason I had to take this uh, the N H one N one. They required it to enter the country, but but those things were all already like we're already light years ahead, you know, with the studies and these things. My biggest concern right now is people are taking these vaccines. They're not sure what's going to happen, if it's going to work. No, no one knows anything. We're, we're trusting and putting faith that, that these things work. My sadness is, what I get sad is when people start to separate into certain, you know, factions. You know, either they're maskers, non-maskers, vaccinators, non-vaccinators. And, you know, I've had the blunt of that from certain people because of how I stand up for people who are not able to take vaccines because they just, their bodies can't handle it. They would just literally die because of, uh, you know, the component, some components in there, but it's really hard to tell people that, you know, mm -hmm. not everybody can take it. There's some people who really want to take it, but they can't, you know, and there's some people who can take it, don't want to take it. So I don't know. The world is in a very, <clears throat> and this is the worldwide thing. And I agree with you. This is like healing globally. It's not like one little region. This is like, Everybody. Everybody. Just everybody. This is everyone. And, it's, and <clears throat> I believe if we focus on the way in which we've imposed um, control op upon free spirit uh, in a damaging way, in the way mm -hmm. in which we've imposed ourselves upon creaturehood in a damaging way, that we begin to, if we start understanding that, like if we go like, hey as a collective humanity let's not like point fingers at one person or one governmental system or one set of uh, policies but like actually as a whole mm -hmm. we've imposed ourselves upon nature in a way that is unhealthy um, yeah. as though we are not connected to it as though somehow we're going to take off in a spaceship the moment that it gets bad that ain't gonna happen mm -mm. like we're here we're here tied into the consequence Right. So, so if we, the reason I believe we're sick is because we've, we've cultivated sickness and um, it's not well or healthy or my description of healthy to be more well adjusted to that. Um, 
I think that people who win in that sick, sick society, mm-hmm. they're, they're also sick. They're mm-hmm. just not feeling the impact of the suffering. It's right. like somebody who's got cancer all through their body, but they don't have any symptoms, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. So my, my feeling is that we can't, just because people don't feel symptomatic of sickness, like their bank account didn't suffer that much during this time, you know, or yeah. they didn't lose their home or right. they didn't lose a family member they loved or their friend didn't die of dr- a drug overdose, you know, that, that just because, just because that's true doesn't mean that the whole of it isn't participating in something that's deeply unwell. Right. And, and until we, until we apply our healing not just towards incidental symptoms, like one person's symptoms, but actually why is that person sick? Like, why is that person sick? As healers, this is a new, this is a new terrain because when we were village folk and we were village healers, we didn't question whether the whole system was sick. Right. And that person, because that person having symptoms, they, we could, we could work with them. Right and heal their symptoms and that would bring them back into village in a heal in a whole and healthy way right yes but when you've got an entire like you know planetary system that's in a state of unwellness and you expect one person to heal their illness within it and have that like what adjust them back into that state of unwellness mm-hmm. like we need to actually broaden our 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 projection into healing that because and I'm not trying to be like powerless here you know like I, I get when people say yeah but like how do you do that I'm like well I don't know but we need to start talking about it I'm not the only person who is talking about it. right but we need to start talking about it mm-hmm. in that way because then we start to find the solutions. if one person like myself or yourself is saying the whole thing needs a rework yeah and everyone's like yeah okay but i'm busy i'm busy like trying to survive this moment i'm like yeah i guess that you're busy trying to survive your moment but you you being busy trying to survive your moment is because that whole thing is sick yeah right so we need to start talking about it differently and and so as a healer that's what i'm focusing on this is why i decided to go back to school iggy Mm -hmm. you know is because uh I, I need the, the attention and I need the, the, uh, the invitation to different tables. Okay. I can see that. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So cause those conversations need to happen at those levels. You see, right. like it's, 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 a, it's one thing for us at a grassroots level, mm-hmm. but then when you're talking to your neighbors who have lost their house or, or to your neighbors who lost, you know, their parents, just recently from sickness or your neighbors who lost, you know, who, who they're destitute, their focus is going to be on that immediate problem. It's not going to be on the global problem. Yeah, this is true. I mean, you can only work, we can only really concentrate on us at sometimes. And I think a lot of people have not concentrated on themselves. And this is a really uh, rude wake up call to actually focus on yourself. You know, Hey, you've kind of ignored yourself. You've been the martyr or you've uh, just totally been strong. You know, it's like that guy who's super strong all his life. And then one day he gets sick and he just totally collapses and dies. And everybody goes, well, why did he die? It's because he has been hiding that in manifesting and in, in not showing the world that feelings and emotions. And then one day it just all comes crashing down. And for, for him or her, they just go, well, I'm just tired. And everybody's like, how can you be tired? You're so strong and blah, blah, blah. And, because people put a lot of emphasis on other people to carry them through the hard times, you know, get me through the hard times. And we haven't really learned to sometimes carry ourselves through the hard times because we're always grasping. And sometimes we don't know where to grasp. Sometimes we don't know how to uh, reach out. Kind of like you said, the world, you know, the world is, it's a, it's a world thing. How do we start? You and I talking, having a conversation. That's what we're doing. Two other people listen on the other side of the show. 10 more people are listening and they go, Hey, did you hear that show? Iggy? And Don are all talking. And you know, that's kind of how it goes. And you know, and if we don't talk about it, we'll never learn. And will we agree and disagree? Of course, that's, that's, that's part of being human. That's part of being you or me. I am you. And sometimes we don't even agree with ourselves, you know? <laughs> so 
Well, I think more than one thing can live in the same place at the same time. Oh, yeah, you know, sure. like, um, you know, you have conversations like this and then there'll be lots of opinions about what to do about it. Right. And some of those opinions might seem like they're conflicting, mm -hmm. but but some of those opinions, even if they're conflicting, they're still valid opinions in the conversation. Um, I believe that we are very accustomed to being told what to think and how to think. I think um, so. That that we're our our critical thinking skills are pretty dull, um, and I don't mean to insult anyone. I just see this. I see this the more that people are moving into media as their source of education, um, mm -hmm. and 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 not necessarily because when you read, man, that's a different process entirely, right? Like yes. when you read, you have to you have to involve critical thinking skills because you don't just like absorb it. You have to think about it differently. Right. Um, and and I mean, no disrespect to media like this. I think this is great. I also mm -hmm. think like I have a podcast and I know like I, I want I want people to listen to it. But I also want place. people mm -hmm. I also want people to read and I want people to really sit and try and understand their world from a place of critical thinking. Because if you don't if you don't do that, then you're subject to whatever anyone tells you is true. And then if something makes its way in there and starts to appease the thing that's suffering the most in you and markets mm -hmm. itself to you, presses right. on your pain points, then you're going to take in all of that subjective matter, you know, all the stuff that applies itself, like, you know, in your, in politics, like when some, when a political party does this and on your pain points and mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, man, I, yeah, you're going to do something about that thing that hurts me so much. Great. You got my vote. And then you right. take on their all their other stuff, right? That maybe you haven't thought about, and maybe isn't actually in your best interest. Yes. And we don't we don't ask questions what, that are are piercing that enough. So if you want to ask, you know, and I don't know if you did ask me this, but you know, as a healer, I, th I seem to remember you think you asked me something about as a healer, how do what do I feel going forward, or how am I experiencing this? As a healer, I feel like I need to be more political. As a healer, I'm a, I'm a greater critical thinker than I was before all of this kicked off. I'm a greater critical thinker, even though I was already pretty critical in my thinking. Sure. I've gotten even more so because for me, it's like, okay, no, you're not allowed to actually sell me that. You can't just sell me that. I have to think about it. And I have to know, is this, is this going to serve not just myself and my loved one, my day, my today? Does yeah. this serve my community? Mm -hmm. Does this serve um, the creaturehood of the community? So that not just the human beings, but also like the animals and the plants and mm -hmm. and the land. Does it serve that those purposes over time? Right. Or is it or is it just right now? You know, and I, I believe we're just like, okay, that's good for you and your family right now. And most people make all their political decisions based on that criteria. It's good for me and my family right now. And I mean, no disrespect to anyone, but we need to be more critical in our thinking than that. I, I, I think so too. And I think that's uh, important. You made a good point that, you know, reading is a valuable thing, valuable tool, something that uh, stimulates our mind and makes, it creates our imagination to work too. It puts us in a place to actually focus and create and construct things inside of our head that maybe we don't see on social media or stuff because that's created for us. Someone makes the construct for you. And so mm -hmm. when this construct is built, then you just kind of follow along with the construct. But if you mm -hmm. read it and you're absorbing it into your critical thinking, then you're asking a lot of questions, like you said. And so that's important. I, th I think that's a very valuable thing. Um, I think right now everybody is just really exhausted and tired because they're not sure what to think. I mean, as cheap as that may sound, but there are a lot of people who just don't know which way to turn or which way they're going is right. And the people who are willing to speak are either shut down or the ones who should speak uh, should should speak and say something and be honest about it. And then there's new leadership that has to evolve, emerge from all this. So the mm -hmm. person, like you said, you know, as a, as a practitioner of uh, the, you know, the holistic work you do, uh, you have to you become more political, right? I've kind of done the same thing to some degree, but I try to listen to both sides of the, of the, of the story. 
I try to say, okay, what, what's your opinion? What's your opinion? And then I try to form something in the middle. So do you ever see something? Do you ever think, do you ever see it like this? And I go, oh, no, I never thought like that. And then, or you'll take it over this and I'm like, oh no, you're, that's irresponsible for you to post that. How can you post that? You know, you get all these different uh, ways that people respond and react to what you're doing. And the biggest thing, you know, for me, you know, perceived leader, they say perceived leader in the community, you should be able to, you know, you shouldn't be posting things like that. Well, I'm also a human being and I also have loved ones and I also have people I care about and I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not and neither are you. You're not going to pretend to be something you're not. You're going to present yourself the best way you can as, as a human first, you know, this world is our world and we're all part of it together. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable and, you know, sometimes you have to become uncomfortable. And sometimes the hard things sometimes don't want to be heard because we already, part of our authority knows it. Mm. Part You've of said us lots, of, lots of really juicy things there, Iggy. Um, the idea that we are owed ease uh, is insane. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. I don't know where that comes from. That I, idea I, that we are owed ease. No, I don't. I don't either. And and that you know, not that there aren't beautiful moments where we can welcome ease because we need to be held and and we need to heal. Like if you're in the middle of being sick or being you know where you need to rest, you should totally welcome ease. Mm -hmm. But you should not welcome ease all the time, because if you welcome ease all the time, you don't develop the musculature you need to be in this in this realm. Um, because this yeah. realm involves it involves like so many things that are not easy and um, that that we can actually take pleasure in the creativity required for us to move into healing. You know, I take pleasure in that. That's why I do this. Like, I don't do this because I'm a martyr. Like, I, I'm not <laughs> sacrificial. I don't, I'm not. I'm not sacrificial. Like, I don't go. You know, people go, oh, you're like, all the work you're doing is so hard. Like, you're, you know, you poor woman. I'm like, no, no, no. I like it. I like, I like the hard I've chosen. I like it. Yeah. Um, and I even love it. And sometimes I even feel like it's, it's like so juicy and so like ah uh, so interesting yeah. that um it's hard for me to turn my face away from it once it start engaging it's like mm -hmm. okay now this is the end of the session i'm going to step away um yeah. but so but people are sort of endlessly interesting to me because um the things that we choose to do in response to the information that we filter and are given and filter out in terms of perception yeah. the things that we choose to do in that place i find endlessly interesting sure and uh and i i sit off and i'm like oh what what creates that behavior now you know like what what's that person trying to solve you know what what they're what are they trying how are they trying to get their needs met mm -hmm. what's the payoff in that where's the goal you know, I'm, I'm always asking those questions because human beings are really endlessly fascinating. And we do have uh, a rationale that, I mean, we can call it spiritual because I believe it is, um, but it doesn't mean it's complicated um, in terms of like its application. It usually yeah. has a rationale, right? This is why we're friends. <laughs> mm. This is why you and I get along because I, I, I believe that. I believe that too. Yeah. I think there's many reasons we get along. This is I, think, I think there's kinship going yes. on. Yes. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I have a lot of love for your um, ancestral home too. I mean, have, uh, you been, have, you, so many, have you been to Peru? Lots of times. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. I have, I, I was until COVID kind of created yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah. Uh, taking people once a year to the jungle. And oh, nice. Yeah, that's right. Peru. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. How did I forget that? I don't know. I don't know. My COVID? mind is COVID. <laughs> My mind's preoccupied, but the COVID vortex of information. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. I remember. I remember you. You did that tour. I did a tour not too long after that. I think when you did yours, mm. into Peru too. So, 
Yeah, yeah, it's taken, um, usually the, the cap is 15 people. Um, when I say usually, sometimes it's a little bit less because I vet, I vet pretty closely right. uh, who gets to come with us um, uh, because I have a trajectory in mind, like a certain sure. way in which I want that work to go. And so I, I want that group to be really curated. But, um, but essentially, like, yeah, we've done the immersion into uh, Indigenous Village in, in, in the jungle. And basically, like, um, my, my way of being with that is to, is to tell people, yes, this is what we're doing, is, mm -hmm. is that we are creating the capacity for you to touch that. Um, experience of being an indigenous village because you probably have no concept of it like, right and and to plug into it in a way that is um immersive people leave changed because of that it's not just the the jungle medicines that we're consuming that creates that change but mm -hmm. actually it's, it's the jungle the jungle that's the, the medicine and also the people uh that that are um, stewarding that land and the creaturehood of the land that become really medicinal. And so I have great love. I've been um, financially supporting the village uh, ever since it started. That's um, pretty cool. Well, it's cool, but it's kind of like necessary because sure. like what else is going to happen? They closed mm -hmm. their borders for a lot of, a lot of time. And so um, I just, I was, I'm not making a lot of money, but I was making enough that I could yeah, do that. And, sure. and so, so I've been continuing to do that. And it's my intention to reestablish that, that journey uh, okay. once we're okay. able to. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of what I've been thinking to do also to reestablish that as well. You run into situations where you have to kind of look at things again and go, wow, didn't see that coming, but now we need to come this way and work in this direction. You know, you have uh, shamans that, you know, fall. Then you have shamans that disappear. You have uh, people who leave the village and go to the cities for better life. You see all kinds of crazy stuff, especially in my country. And now with COVID, Peru's pretty locked down. My uncle passed away in Peru of COVID and another uncle as well. So I've had family members who have passed. They're pretty, uh, pretty stringent right now. And those who are getting in, they're getting in through different means, but but I, I always wonder what how Pachimama plays in all this and how she is uh, seeing her children uh, as we navigate on on her and through her with her. And um, how do you feel about her? What do you think? Is she? Some people think she's punishing us, and some people I'm like, no, I don't think she's punishing us. What do you think about Pachimama and all this? I think we are punishing us. Yeah. Um, I think we are punishing us because we think that that's what we deserve. Yeah. Um, I don't think that Pachimama has a will to punish mm -hmm. her children. Um, She's just doing vision. her thing. She's doing her thing, She's right? Doing her thing. Um, my belief is that I, I believe that in terms of our evolution, we need to step out of our relationship as uh, children of the mother, the great mother, and actually lovers too. You know, we need to step into that role of the lover. Um, I started speaking about this maybe 10 years ago. I had a vision about moving from children of the earth to lovers of the okay. earth. And what would you do if, you know, how would you tend to your lover? Because it's a different relationship than being a child to a mother, right? Like being a child to a mother is often very consumptive. You know, children, yeah. and it take a lot of energy, you know? Yes. Like, you have some, I have some, they take yes. a lot of energy. Um, and then at, <laughs> and then at a certain point, do you grow up? Do you get, do you get to then like behave towards the beings in your life in a responsible way? And yeah, what yeah. I see is that the continuation of the childlike behavior goes well into adulthood as, as we, you know, in the way that we're treating the creaturehood, it's like this well continued process into adulthood where we're consuming like we are babies yeah you know? and we're not babies we don't get to do that right you know that's pretty powerful that's like you said juicy that's i like that that makes a lot of sense mm. that makes a lot of sense because a child will behave a certain way and react a certain way respond a certain way but a lover is 
is engaged much differently. Mm-hmm. Much differently. You would hope. You would hope. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you hope. <laughs> but you know, you I get that. I, I get that. See, this is this is how we learn. This is because we have these communications, these dialogues with one another. So that's that's a nugget in my head now, floating around, going, you know, that's important to know. Well, I see you in that way, though, behaving in that lover to way, Iggy, like the way you treat you are with your groups and the way that you are with your ancestral land. And I, mm-hmm. the way that you are in the world is lover to, mm-hmm. you know, you're like, I'm doing the thing to tend to mm-hmm. the need. Um, in, in, um, in Irish pagan culture, um, there is a time in, in the transition of the year called Lunasa. And Lunasa is like, the end of July, beginning of August. It used to be uh, in the lunar observation, the full moon, the last full moon of July, first full moon of August. But now it's more like um, they celebrated July 31st, August 1st in the mm-hmm. Gregorian calendar. And the, the, basically the tenets of Lunasa is like, you as a human being have an oath, you have a promise. You, you come into the world, you have an oath and a promise. Okay. You are not nothing. You are not a child that is completely open to everything. You actually come in and you are supposed to give that gift. That is what you give to the earth, to the people, so that there is sustenance. And at Lunasa, it's the last whisper of the, of the earth's gift to us. It's like all the fruit trees are ripe, all the, like, all the, everything's growing. That's cool. You know? Yeah. Um, so the earth is like, here, take the food take the food and then the people are supposed to like think wow how much do i need to put in my pantry in order to get me through the winter how much do i need to gather and how many pies do i need to make how much do i need to distribute to the villagers um how much needs to go on to the ancestral plate how much sell how much do i need to pray for in terms of the next season what is growing and what is not what do i need to plant here in order you know, we have to be responsible in Lunasa, even though all the trees are bearing fruit. We don't act like children and eat until we throw up. We, we put some of that stuff in the pantry so we're not starving to death in January. I gotcha, yeah. You know, so that's Lunasa. And Lu, God Lu, was an oaf. That's what his name meant. I'm an mm-hmm. oaf. And so we, as humans, uh, when we become adults, we are not like wanderers and like not knowers and like not feelers like we are purposeful that's yeah. what makes us adults you know uh if you're not purposeful you're still in it in your childhood which is okay you know which is okay but you're not you don't know your purpose until you start taking action right, right? yeah so yeah. for me like my older son is always like i don't know what my passion is i don't know he's 22 and i'm like Maybe you don't need to know just yet, but you need to do something that helps you cultivate knowing. It. Absolutely. You know? That's true. So, That's very true. Mm-hmm. Keep yourself busy and keep yourself going. Cause then, you know, it'll, cause it'll just, it, that moment, that aha moment will come boom. You're like, oh, I know. But you can have multiple passions. You oh. know, it, it doesn't have yeah, to be just I one have. thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, I have. <clears throat> yeah. You dance. I, I don't. I know my one purpose is this, though. What's that? Iggy, I, when I danced, I, I've danced, I've written, I've spoken, I've healed, I've done all those kinds of things. And yes, you know what my major passion is. My major passion is compassion. Oh, cool. That's my, that's my purpose. Yeah. So whether I'm showing it through dance or writing or ceremony or whatever, my, my heart, my purpose is to share this compassion. Beautiful. Sometimes Sometimes it looks really hard, but you know, it's yeah. still compassion. Yeah. Good, good, good. I, I I like you to maybe share if you like the story about how you your name came about. Hmm. I think I did this one time with you. You before, did right? Like the very I first about- the first time I interviewed you. That was several years ago. But mm-hmm. for this new batch of people who probably wonder how'd you get her name Dawn Dancing Otter, I know the mm-hmm. story, but for the listeners. Mm, so I, I was, cool story. yeah, it's a cool story. Um, Cause it kind of goes I along was, with what we're talking about. 
It does, yeah, it does. It come, it, this is the story in a lot of ways of my oath and my purpose, um, birthing itself through a body that was dying. Um, so I, I was deathly ill at, um, in the latter part of my 20s. And rather than go the route of receiving medical care for it, uh, which was basically the only opportunity that was being told me that would work, that would heal me, mm -hmm. or you're going to die, you know, like, or you're going to die. Um, I remember being terrified, you know, just really terrified, not knowing what to do. But the notion I had in my head as I left from the hospital and went home was I needed to talk to my naturopath. My naturopath is um, still a very close friend of mine. Um, and she said, you know, I think you need to see this man I know um, because, you know, it sounds like you really need help, like, right now. Because what I had asked her for was like, can you help me? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really sick. Can you help me with this? And she said, you know, do you have time? And I said, I don't think so. Like, I don't think I do. And she said, well, anything I have to do would take time. And if you don't have time, I think you really need to talk to this man. And so she passed along uh, Manfred Lucas's number to me. And Manfred Lucas was a... He died in 2015. He was a healer. Um, he was a medicine man. Um, he was a teacher. Mm -hmm. He was a lover unto the earth. Um, I called him and tried to make an appointment. And at the time, his wife was taking his calls and making appointments for him. And when I was talking on the phone with her, I was like, I really need to see him. And she, she said, well, his next appointment's like four months down the mm -hmm. road, right? Right. And, and I was like, I was in pretty desperate shape. And I said, well, I'll take that appointment, but, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be there. And if I don't show up, it's because I'm not walking the earth. And she said, oh, well, you know, um, I'll put you on the uh, waiting list, but you know you should know that the waiting list is usually not accessed. Like people don't cancel appointments. And the next morning, someone canceled their appointment, and I ended up at his office. Uh, well, his office, mm -hmm. which was in his house, and his downstairs had um, had bison uh, hides all over the floor. And I remember sitting across from him and he was doing a bit of council work with me before we did a journey. Um, and in the council work, I was being kind of a pessimistic dick, you know, mm -hmm. like, because uh, <laughs> I was pretty sure it wasn't going to help me. Like, I, sure. I was like, uh, he was really compelling as a creature, but I didn't know why I was there, what was, how, the, how that was going to help me. And mm -hmm. He did the journey and came back from the journey. And in the journey, he had found um, a number of things that were really out of balance. Um, he explained to me without me having explained to him that, uh, that I had had an eating disorder. And I did. I had a really severe eating disorder, um, which is probably part of the reason I think that I was so ill. But uh, he explained to me why I had that eating disorder. And I was like, how could he know that? How could mm -hmm. he know? Um, so in some ways that lends itself to credibility. And then he said, do you, do you know um, what animal that you're interested in um, the most as, as in terms of relationship? Like what, what animals interest you? And I said, oh, I feel like I'm a horse um, because you know, that my spirit is a horse because mm -hmm. horse, and he, it's like, well, what do you like about horses so much? And I said, horses are really beautiful and really strong and like really free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they run with a lot of freedom. And, and he said, uh, 
Yeah, well, they're also like quite domesticated. You know, most of the horses around us are really domesticated. Um, they work pretty hard, hey? And I said, yeah, I guess so. And I'm, I started to get really uncomfortable because I knew mm -hmm. he was about to tell me something. You know, like when people are going to drop the troop bomb, yeah. I knew something was going to happen. And I, I was like, okay, I don't know what you're getting at. But, um, and he said, well, you know, that's why you're sick, right? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> he said, you're sick because you don't know who you are. You don't know why you're here. You don't know what you're good for. And I was like, uh, and he told me that I was connected in my animus to the otter and that that animal was deeply in relationship to me on a cellular level and that my purpose was in learning the way to play. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Like I had no clue. Yeah. like zero awareness my whole my whole world was like intellectual um work orientated you know order of operation applying schedule time my time was stretched so thin by that and i was such a workaholic that i think i was working with a little baby like gabriel was four months old at the time uh, that i I was so stretched in that I couldn't, I didn't even know what play was about. Like, yeah. I, like he was talking to me about play and it was actually crushing my heart a little bit because I felt like, how do I even, then I felt so much despair because I was like, I, I don't even know what to do with that. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> like you're telling me that's why I'm dying and I'm telling you, I don't know how to do that thing. And, um, so, and that's, the beautiful thing in, in, in healing, I'm tearing up a bit. Yeah, I see. Um, um, thinking about the gift Manfred gave me that day because um, he saved my life, you know, like he saved my life because if you don't know who you are, how can you be mm -hmm. here? Right. If you don't know who you are, you don't know why you're here, you don't know what you're good for. Um, and I won't say that I changed like that. Like right. it didn't happen that way because I didn't get sick that way, you know? Sure. But what happened was pretty miraculous from that day forward. Um, my, my blood tests were coming back more healthy and slowly and progressively, mm -hmm. I was feeling better. Uh, it took a year for me to come back physically. But I would say emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, it was that was what aligned that day and my body started to follow suit which is usually how things work right mm -hmm. and so which is that's how you get sick too starts up here in the in the metaphysical and, it, and then it, it yeah. finds itself in the body you know and the body starts to say okay this is we're just doing what you told us <laughs> right exactly um and my body started to learn how to play again and I started to learn how to play again. And I started to learn how to be, um, how to be like bad at things, you know, like how to be not necessarily bad at things, but like totally, totally a beginner, how to be a complete beginner at anything. That's awesome. And, and the, the, the story that I tell about that, so afterwards, I developed a, a teaching relationship, a student relationship as a protege of Manfred for mm -hmm. a number of years after that. He was my teacher. And uh, I have a whole other story around that, but that was sort of like a Mr. Miyagi, Daniel kind of relationship. <laughs> cool. For real. For real. Oh, no, I believe you. <laughs> I believe it. Um, and uh, that during that time um, of learning, what I, the, the most valuable thing that I learned to be was in the wanderer. Like, I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know how that is. I don't have a plan there. And to be receptive to the guidance so that I could do things rather than trying to do that in reverse order, you know? And when I started to dance again from that space, I started to really play with like 
all the ecstatic dance practices that I had learned in my early 20s started to become really important to me. And then um, Manfred, during during my my learning from him, said to me, you really, you know, the dancing otter in the water. And so then I was named that. And I went mm -hmm. by that. I started going by that in the early 2000s. And I haven't, no one, no one's known me by anything else, yeah. uh, really. Uh, some people call me DDO now, or um, <laughs> some people just call me Otter. Um, some people mix up the order and call me uh, Dancing Dawn Otter, which is also fun. Um, but uh, Dawn was my birth name, and mm -hmm. uh, Dancing Otter became my surname. And so, um, yeah, that's the story of how I got my name. Yeah, I love it. I love that story. I use that story in some of the work I do. When yeah. I'm teaching students, oh yeah, I, I I don't know, I didn't know all. It was you. you there, there's even more pieces at, that you just shared with me that you didn't share before, which is really cool too. So, but yeah. that's uh that's beautiful though. Yeah. How names come uh, about? How names come about? Um, I've, I've had students. Like... Go ahead. I said I have students who they want to be called something else, and then I'm like, well, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's kind of goes with, you know, kind of know that story. I know when you were saying that about your teacher, how he was, he's like, how that affects your body, how it affects your psyche and everything. So I know how that is. The sensei to, you know, student type, you know, relationship. Honestly, if you, you know this, right. Don't take up the mantle of a name unless you want to live it because you'll be asked to, you'll be asked to live it. Yes, that um, is true. And, and then you'll be demanded if you don't if you don't comply. Yeah. Um, so I I step in as much as uh, you know, not just as much as I can, but with my being to that mm -hmm. to that way of being. I am playful, and I take very few things seriously. Even though it may seem like I take everything seriously, um, I don't. I'm I play with it. Like I don't know how things are going to work out. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not certain. That's not my being. I'm not certain about it. I do have knowing, but that knowing shifts and changes because the elements shift and change and the earth grows. So yes. that knowing that knowing isn't like written in stone. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, you know, what's in the name, right? That's what they say. What's in the name? Well, there's a lot in the name. You know, like you said, take on that mantle. Cause uh, I remember when I was, one of my first names was uh, Roaring Chipmunk. I don't know if you knew that. They called me Roaring Chipmunk. I love it. <laughs> and so a lot of people don't know that, but from different, you know, elder groups, different uh, tribes, different organizations. And one called me uh, Thundering Forebears. That was with uh, Lakotas. The the other one was another Lakota. And the last one with the Nemanha, they called me Hoop Watcher one who walks with the animals and walks the hoop, the medicine wheel. So in, in Shehepton, it's called a Shaloshi. Shaloshi means the hoop watcher. So that's my name. A lot of people don't know that I go by a hoop watcher. Mm. So powerful wow. medicines. That's powerful. Did you know that, um, that in the Irish culture that, um, the circle or the spiral is the most significant symbol of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I look at hoop dancing, I think of it in that way, you yeah. know, or like at, at the sacred hoop, I, I think about it in, in terms of the spiral um, yeah. and, and that being a representation in the wheel of, of our journey as humans, right. the journey as a living animated being. Yeah. So the 13 council of mothers, they name me hoop watcher. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Like it's, it. it's a big honor. You know, it's like, it's a big responsibility too. I was like, well, that's a big name, you know? No, you're fine. You can handle it. <laughs> so they, so oh, you're all over it. <laughs> you're all over it. Yeah. And I like dancing. I like hooping. I like, you like all of it drumming. So anything with circles, I'm, I'm into it. So, well, you're Don, we're going to, we're, we're winding down to our time here. So I wanted to see if you, if you had any last thoughts that you wanted to leave with our listeners, something that um, 
maybe you didn't get to say or share that you wanted yeah. to? Yeah, wherever you're living on the planet, um, get to know the stewards of the land, get to know those people, um, get to know the songs and the languages and the dances of the land, get to know the weaves, get to know the relationships and develop a relationship to place. Mm -hmm. And while we are not so move, you know, movement oriented in our travel, take the opportunity to really ground into that relationship to place and ask invitation to weave in, ask invitation rather than impose, ask for it. Like, can, can I join here with my, my spirit, my good intentions, and then wait and see if you are invited. And if you are invited, know what it is that you have to leave behind because there is something that you will be asked to let go of so that you can become part of that belonging. And then there will be many responsibilities mm -hmm. that you are given in that place. And if you, if you behave in this way, the, it peels back the layers of colonized thinking. And this is, I believe, our way forward. This is how we become lovers to mm -hmm. the earth. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. I want to thank you for joining me tonight, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, share your heart, your feelings, your emotions with us and, and teach us something new. I learned something new today, which is awesome. And um, also learn some new possibilities to see things differently than I probably had, yeah. haven't before. So this is why we have community. This is why we hang out and talk and share. So um, I'm blessed to have you in my life. I'm very grateful and thankful. You know, so and I'm always watching uh, you, watching you from afar on the Instagram. You, feed. <laughs> you are lovely. And I really enjoy your energy. And I Thank always you. feel so, such a kinship between us. So yes, absolutely. anytime you want to do this, and you should come on my podcast too. All right. We'll, that's a deal you, you you invite me to your podcast and i'll join you and i'll Definitely. and i'll share yeah. i'll get to share mm -hmm. stories about me with you and your mm -hmm. guests and your your peoples i might add if anyone wants to find me i'm at the weaveworkschool.com and then um the witches diagnostic podcast which is everywhere yeah i'm pretty excited and, about that yeah facebook instagram all those places awesome <laughs> awesome so uh, I want to thank you again, and I want everybody to thank you for tuning in tonight and hanging out with me and my friend Don here, um, just learning and just communicating and talking like people should, you know, just just having discussions and learning. So with that, I want to say thank you, Mataku Yasin, Ho'oponopono, it's good to be here, what is above is below, Idi Sikwi, and you know, with that, I want to say a ho, and I want to say we'll see you guys next time. And so and next week... Next Monday, I have, uh, I don't know if you know her, her name is uh, Tanya, the herbalist. She's from Canada, too. She's from your, yeah. so she's, uh, I got the Canadian week, <laughs> which is cool. So she's, uh, she's an herbalist. She's very, she's going to be a very powerful person as well, sharing her story about what she does and how she feels about COVID. She's, she's a little bit more, she's a little bit more, uh, you know, like, don't like it, don't want it, don't need it we're being abused so it's going to be fun it's going to be a good challenge for me to to have her on my show just to see a different perspective on someone who sees the world in a different light so i'm looking forward to that it's exciting but bye don thank you very much bye, Iggy. and we'll thank keep you. in touch mm -hmm. take care